All right, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about solution formation, and we'll talk about some gaseous solution here, gaseous <laughs> solutions, liquid solutions, solid solutions, and then focus a little bit on molecular solutions and how they are formed. But of course, you remember that a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. And yes, we typically think of solutions as taking a solid, dissolving into liquid, and that liquid is almost always water. But there are other ones too. They may exist in any of the three states of matter. And so we have our terms, of course, solute and solvent. So again, if we're putting a gas or solid into a liquid, then the gas or solid is the solute. The liquid, of course, is the solvent. And again, usually that is water. Now, if we're not talking about that situation, then whatever the component in the smaller amount, that would be the solute, whereas the greater amount would be the solvent. And let's see an example of that. Okay, so we have gaseous solutions. We need to be talking about non-reactive gases or vapors here, because if you mix reactive gases, then you'll have a chemical reaction, not a mixture. And so air, of course, is our most common example of a gaseous solution. And so what would be the solvent in air? Well, it would be the gas in the larger, largest amount, which of course we know is nitrogen. So nitrogen is the solvent for air, and then all the other gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, noble gases, etc., those are the solutes. Now when you mix these non-reactive gases, they are what we say completely miscible. And gases are fluids, so are liquids. Now gases, of course, there's no intermolecular forces of attraction between the gas particles under normal conditions. So of course they're completely miscible, they ignore each other. But liquids can be that way too. So here we see um, miscible versus immiscible over here on the left. And so when I have a solution, let's see if I can do this, I'm trying to do this on the laptop. Oh, it thought it was a circle. <laughs> I was trying to enlarge it. But you can see when we have immiscible liquids, there's a definitive line there. You can see a meniscus separating the two liquids. Whereas when you have miscible fluids, they just completely blend together. That's like ultimate dissolving. When you have completely miscible fluids, they just, the particles just interchange, um, intertwine amongst each other, and you have completely, complete dissolvability. Solid solutions, we talked about those a little bit in class, alloys. So if you have mixtures of solids, that's one classic example, again, alloys. Remember, they can be interstitial or substitutional. So hopefully you remember or know the difference between those two types of alloys. All right, so this dissolving process. And here we're going to look at it through a crystalline solid, okay, our, our most famous sodium chloride. And what happens is the water molecules surround the ions of opposite charge and pull them apart. And so you're pulling apart the different positive and negative ions by these water molecules surrounding them. Eventually, we reach a dynamic equilibrium. So when I put solid sodium chloride into water, I get sodium and chloride ions. Well, there's going to be a point in time where they won't dissolve anymore, at least numerically. You can't get any more of it to dissolve. But if you looked microscopically, you would notice that the crystal is still dissolving. A lot of the crystals are still dissolving, but every time some of it dissolves, some of the sodium and chloride ions in solution precipitate backwards and go back to being into the solid. So again, there'll be a point in time where this equilibrium, where the forward and reverse reactions are happening at the same rate, and so that, that's why we call this a dynamic equilibrium. It's not just sitting still doing nothing. And so again, the point in time where this happens, we have what's called a saturated solution. And for us, we're going to say that's the amount of a substance that dissolves in a given quantity of water, since that's what we typically deal with around here. And it must be at a given temperature, because as we'll talk about later, obviously temperature can affect how much of a solute dissolves in water. 
So here we see the solubility of sodium chloride. We can put 30, dissolve 36 grams of sodium chloride into 100 milliliters of water at 20 degrees Celsius. So if I look at this, let me try and see if it will let me do this. Ooh. Yes! All right, so when I put 30 grams of sodium chloride into 100 milliliters of water, it completely dissolves, and we say that that solution is unsaturated because I have the ability to dissolve more sodium chloride into that water. Now, This time, when I put 40 grams of sodium chloride into the 100 milliliters of water, 36 of it will dissolve. 4 grams will remain undissolved at the bottom. The solution is saturated. And again, this is where we would see the dynamic equilibrium. Some of the solid would be dissolving. Some of the ions would precipitate back. But overall, 36 grams would stay dissolved. 4 grams would remain undissolved. All right, that was just a refresher of saturated, unsaturated. Of course, there's super saturated as well. If you take your solvent and heat it up really high, dissolve excess solute into it, and then cool it back down, trapping that solute in there, that's what we, if you remember, is called super saturated. All right. So we end up with this little phrase called like dissolves like, because we tend to see that substances that have similar properties will dissolve in each other. So nonpolar solutes will dissolve in nonpolar solvents, whereas ionic or polar solutes in polar solvents. Is that always the case? Of course not. We're going to see plenty of exceptions. But for a general rule of thumb, and if a question pops up on the AP exam like which of the following will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent, you would look for the nonpolar solute. Okay, here's some cute little pictures. Poor Ralph over here, after finishing his freshman year, he was afraid to go near the water again because he's a polar bear. <laughs> okay, but as it says here, the solubility of a solute in a solvent depends on a balance between the natural tendency for the solute and solvent to mix and also, though, to have the lowest energy possible. So if it's a lower energy situation where they won't mix, that's what's going to happen. So let's focus here on molecular solutions to end this video. Gases dissolved in gases, as we mentioned, they are all miscible, like our air. There are no intermolecular forces to factor in. Okay, because what's happening when we talk about molecular solutions is there's a fight between the intermolecular forces. And when we have intermolecular forces that are relatively equal, they're going to be miscible. Okay, so octane and heptane, both nonpolar hydrocarbons, only have London dispersion forces. They, you can see they're going to have similar masses. So these two molecular compounds will be miscible because there's really no favorite attractions from one or the other. They're very, very similar. If those intermolecular forces are quite different, that's when we're going to see immiscible. So a nonpolar solvent and a polar solute won't mix, or vice versa. Octane, our C8H18 up here, nonpolar London dispersion forces will not be miscible in water. Okay, the hydrogen bonds of water are way favored. Water's going to do its own thing. Octane's going to have to do its its own thing, and that's when you're going to see something like this picture. Okay, and so again, when the intermolecular forces between the two substances are similar, we will see miscible solutions, and if they're not, we won't. All right, now there's the general summation then there. The more similar the IMFs are, the more miscible. The less similar they are, the less miscible. So again, think of oil and water, nonpolar polar or oil and vinegar like your salad dressing. But as those IMFs come closer and closer together, things become more miscible. Now here's a little exception, of course, that we'll end with. What's going on here? Here we see the solubilities of some alcohols in water. 
the first couple alcohols are are small okay we've got methanol which is just one carbon with some hydrogens and a hydroxide here alcohols all end with this OH a hydroxyl group ethanol two carbons then the hydroxyl propanol three carbons then the hydroxyl and you can see that all of them have an infinity sign here and as it says down here the infinity symbol indicates that the alcohol is completely miscible with water so that means you can put an unlimited amount of this into 100 grams of water at 20 degrees Celsius then all of a sudden we start to see a little change the next biggest alcohol butanol with four carbons I can only put 0.1 moles into that hundred milliliters of water pentanol now I can only put 0.03 hexanol six carbons 0.006 heptanol 0.0008 okay so eventually these alcohols are going to be completely immiscible why well when we got our little alcohols they are much more similar to water okay so again remember the more similar the IMFs the more miscible so these three alcohols must have very similar IMFs to water whereas the next ones do not and that's what this is telling us as the carbon chain gets longer the alcohol becomes less like water the carbon hydrogen portion of the alcohol is very very nonpolar okay this part well that didn't do well but you can see sorry that the carbon hydrogen por portion of the alcohol is nonpolar and so the more prevalent that becomes the more nonpolar like the alcohol becomes even though it has the little OH at the end that could form hydrogen bonds the other part is dominating and so the IMFs between the water molecules and the alcohol molecules become much more different and they become immiscible all right so again with molecular compounds figuring out if they're gonna dissolve in each other or not it's the IMFs and so when we have similar IMFs we will find miscible solutions non-similar immiscible and like I said this is a nice little exception to those rules that the AP likes to look at every once in a while I hope this helps, and I'll see you soon.